isn't that awesome to get to watch life change stories through our baptism on Sunday morning? I just wanted to give the Lord a hand again just for... I, I pray and hope after 17 and a half years, uh, we're continuing to see these life change stories. We're so excited. I pray it never, ever ends around here. That is uh, part of the heartbeat of this place. So we're so thankful you guys are here as we kick off a brand new series entitled The Big Give. Now, this series is all about how you and I, us together, can really make a difference in our world today. And I understand that when you look around the world, and I do too, and you see all the problems that are going on in the world, it is easy to be overwhelmed and begin to ask this question, what difference can I really make? What difference can our family really make? It feels so daunting, so overwhelming, the problems. How can we really make any kind of a difference? And today, we're gonna look at Jesus' answer to this question that in his most famous sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses a very important question that he not only uh, poses as something that we should be asking, it's something that um, we ought to every day, as if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a Christian, that it should be something that you're answering often, like, hey, yes, I, I, I want to be making a difference, and there is a way in which we can do that, and this is what we're going to talk about today. But I want to back up real quick and look at who the audience of this sermon was. It starts in Matthew chapter 5, back in verse 1. We're told that Jesus is talking to the multitudes. He's talking to crowds of people, likely thousands and thousands of people. Now here's what's interesting about this. Is that this crowd that he's talking to is not the powerful Romans it is not the wise Athenians of his day. It's not the religious scholars of Jerusalem. It is the average, everyday, ordinary people like you and me. They weren't power brokers. They weren't celebrities. They were just average people. And he gives these people two powerful, difference-making metaphors that are so relevant, so brilliant. They are still relevant right down to this day. And this is the power of Jesus' teaching. He is literally the wisest person that ever lived. And, and you, the more you dive into what he said and how he said it, you realize, wow, we're dealing with not just a, uh, you know, an, an uh, you know, insightful person. We're, we're dealing with the, the greatest genius that ever lived. It is literally God in the flesh. And when we start to understand it from that standpoint, it's powerful what it can do for our lives. See, Jesus here is making a pivot. He had been up to this point, all through the Beatitudes, and this is what we were covering in the last series, um, was Jesus serious? We've been looking at, and, and as we turned out, it was, he was serious, okay? So anyway, as we went through all of that, the Beatitudes, we were looking at what he says what we ought to be. These are the kinds of people that ought to be if we're going to be people of the kingdom of God. Now he's going to pivot and say, Let's go from what you are, you are to how you're to behave, how you're to behave. And so this is a, an incredible pivot, and he gives us these two powerful metaphors. So let's dive into the very first one. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13. So we're picking up right where we left off last time I talked about this, this sermon. And here's what Jesus says. You, right? Now remember, you is you individually, but also you corporately. He's talking to thousands of people. You are the what? The salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Now, the what people in Jesus' congregation, if you will, out there on the hillside outside of Capernaum would have known that maybe we might not quite understand. In his day, salt is a preservative. They didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have any way to build a preserved food outside of salt. Now, just like, and probably most importantly, meat, when it is rubbed with salt, it helps to cure the meat. Now, if you have ever left accidentally meat out on the counter and you left town for a couple of days and you came home after three or four or five days, that is rancid, isn't it? It's horrible. Micro... Uh, the you know, biotic uh, little um, organisms, a little bacteria have made their way onto that meat and they have started to decompose the meat. It is starting to rot and it starts to what? Oh, it smells so bad. I mean, cleaning up the mess is bad enough, but the smell is horrible. 
And this is exactly why the salt was used. It was used to preserve. And this is Jesus using this metaphor to say, if you're my follower, you're one of my people, you're a disciple of me, you're a Christian, then you need to understand you have been placed in this world, you have been placed in this world as a preservative to help preserve the decomposing um, society in which you, have, you are living. I want you to be that preservative, to be able to help delay the moral and spiritual deterioration that is happening all around us. And you see it constantly. The needle doesn't stay in one place when it comes to morality and spirituality, is it? It's always moving in a darker direction. As a matter of fact, I mean, we see in other places in the New Testament where Paul, like in Ephesians, he says, be careful. The days are evil. In other words, if you pick up your feet and let the culture take you, it's not going to go towards light. It'll go towards darkness. It's going to be, it's going to take you to a place you do not want to go. So you are, he's in other words saying, you are the preservative of the entire earth. This, and, and this ought to shock us, the scope of what he just said. Not just that you're the salt of your region or your town, but the whole earth. You're to make an impact in the whole earth. In other words, this is really kind of interesting here. Um, it's like Jesus is saying, forget about the Caesars of the world. Forget about the Herods and the Plato's, right? He's saying, in, in today's language, he would say, forget about the YouTube stars. Forget about the social media celebrities. That's not what God needs. What God needs is ordinary people. Ordinary people following the ways of an extraordinary God. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what our life ought to emanate. That's what we ought to be known for. That is the flavor or the seasoning. That is the salt of our life. But here's where it gets interesting. Because in the, the very next part of this same verse, verse uh, 13, he goes on to explain this. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness... How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. In, in other words, he's saying, listen, salt, and here's what we know about salt. Salt actually can't lose its saltiness, but here's what salt can be. It can be adulterated. It can be diluted. It can be um, contaminated. Let's say we, it was adulterated with like sand. If you mix sand and salt together, now the purpose, the, the worth of the, the salt goes down. Like you wouldn't want to rub salt and sand on any of your food. Have you ever tried to eat lunch on the beach? Okay. And you get that grindy kind of, oh, the sand got in the hot dog. Oh, this is terrible. But I'm hungry, so I'm going to eat this anyway. Um, but yeah, it, that's, a, that's a horrible place to be. And you don't, in the moment that happens, you're going, the sand is no longer good. It, the only thing it's good for is to be thrown out. Like if maybe there's some ice somewhere, I could put the, <laughs> the sand on the ice and maybe it'll help keep people from slipping. That's really the only thing it's good for. In other words... Jesus is showing us here, he's saying, listen, your life should have a distinctive flavor that represents Jesus that is different than the world around you. There should be a distinctive difference, but there is constantly a pressure that you will have to fight, I have to fight it every single day, that we don't get adulterated by the sand of this world that sneaks in constantly and tries to take away the flavor of Jesus and it makes you taste like the insipid, non-flavor taste of everything else in this world. It is trying to rob you of the very thing that Jesus says, this is the reason for which you are here. This is the reason why I have left you on this planet earth. Have you ever wondered that? Like, why didn't God just take us to heaven as soon as you become a Christian? Wouldn't that be nice? Like, it, or it seems like it would be. But Jesus is saying, no, i got work for you. I've got some things I want you to do, but you've got to have a distinctive difference. If you are not different than the world around you, you can't help the world around you. You ever thought about it like that? If there's not a distinct, salty, flavored, seasoned difference that represents Jesus in your life, you don't have anything to offer the world around you. And neither do I. And this is what Jesus was getting at. Even though salt can't lose its saltiness, it can be adulterated and no longer has any 
purpose. It loses its purpose. It loses its worth. It's worth in its ability to represent, and we do too. When we get diluted, we lose our worth and our purpose as children of God and that worth and purpose of representing the presence of God wherever we go. And this is part of what Jesus wanted us to do. And if we're not careful, this world will begin to creep in and we will get jaded and we will get cynical. We will get hopeless and we will become darkened by the world around us. And I've seen this happen so many times to Christians, people. And it's sad because they've lost the saltiness. Now, you focus on the dark places and it will start to impact you. This is why we take time daily to remind ourselves of the, 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 the salt of Jesus, His Word, His character, how He's called us. And He's called us to live this in a relationship, interactive relationship. This is not some kind of pretense of like, let's just all act, try to act like good Christians out there. This is flowing from who we actually are. When we're doing this, we're consistent with who we are. We're not pretending, we're not acting. We're just finally starting to behave consistent with integrity with what we say we believe and what we say we, we claim to, to be most important. Now, in the world that we live in, there's a, gosh, constantly, what used to be just common decency and, and common human like value systems are just not so common anymore. Let me give you one for instance, and this is something that has been derived from the salt of Jesus' teaching. When someone, when someone sees someone being generous, when we see someone being generous or compassionate, why do we see that as good, that is good, instead of weak? You realize when Jesus was speaking these words about salt, and we're going to see more about it in just a minute, he was speaking it into a Roman-dominated culture that saw compassion and generous as a weakness. It's, they saw it as a non-virtue. Why would you be merciful? Why would you do that? Why would you let somebody else ahead? Why would you lend or use your resources or your influence or your power to help somebody else that couldn't help you? Like, why, that's just dumb. That's what they taught. Jesus taught the opposite. But here today... Many times when we hear stories about people who are overtly compassionate and generous, we, are, we have the audacity to be inspired by stories like that. Where do we get that? That is an exclusively Jesus ethic. That is an exclusively Jesus teaching. It comes from nowhere else. Now, many other people have echoed it since Jesus, but that's where it comes from. He's saying when you do this, you're bringing my flavor. You're bringing my flavor. This isn't just basic human decency. This isn't just basic human values. No, not at all. It is something that only Jesus taught. Why do we see, and this is really an important one too, why do we see children as precious, even unborn children, and every person has value and dignity? Everybody. Where do we get that? That is, again, exclusively Jesus' teaching. This is him saying, I want you to understand what it means to be salt, what it means to make a difference in the world, to treat people and to walk through this life. No matter how much people may push back on that, that is the value system from God. You see, it comes from a worldview that Jesus taught, that Jesus says that there is one God and he loves every single one of you and he loves every person you will ever come in contact with, every person you will ever talk to on the phone, whether you see him or not, every person you ever pass on the street, every person you will ever even be acknowledging of in your life. He loves all those people and we will all give account to that God. This is what Jesus taught. And he's saying, now I want you to live this life in a relationship with me, upholding the value systems that I teach. And when you do that, you are salt of the earth. That you will have a flavor and a seasoning that will draw people to me because of how you've chosen to behave, how you've chosen to live. And this is so incredibly important that we remember this until we begin to live this way. 
because it's so easy for us to get diluted in time if we're not careful. And and, and this may surprise you, but even in our community that we live, there are things that have been allowed to go on that we as God's people, he's called us to address. Like even in our community, we have widows who are suffering. Women whose husbands have passed and they are struggling emotionally, spiritually, physically, resources needed. We have right here in this community, young pregnant mothers, maybe that weren't planning on being young pregnant mothers. And they need resources to be able to care for and to love their children and to take care of them well. And they need someone to come alongside them and help them. And and this one may shock you most of all, that right here in the Brazos Valley, we have an, an issue of sex trafficking that comes right through this Brazos Valley. And it may blow your mind to think, in 2022, do we really have human slavery still happening? Yes, we do. And it's happening in our own backyard. And Jesus has called us to do something about this. That we can't just sit by and say, well, what are you going to do? The world's a horrible place and there's just nothing we can do about it. There is something we can do about it. And that's what this series is all about. We can't do something about every single problem in the world, but we can address some of these. And we can help. And that's what we're going to do over the next several weeks. We're going to talk about how we can help and how we can come together. And that you corporately and you individually and me too, and we can all come together to make a difference. And I'm going to begin to unpack that even more next week, specifically how that's going to look and how we can make a difference. And I think going into Thanksgiving this year, we're going to be even, there's so much more to be thankful for. <laughs> it's going to be awesome, and I hope you will not miss this and be a, that you will plan to be a part of it. So our first metaphor, Jesus has called us to be salt. Secondly, he has called us to be light. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, here's what he says. You are the light, let's say it together, you are the light of the world. Once again, look at the scope. He's saying, You, you individually, you corporately, you are the light of the whole world. Now, this had to make some of the people of the first century scratch their head and say, Jesus, are you like serious right now? Most of those people had never traveled more than about 50 miles from their home their whole life. He's like, so we're going to be the light of the whole world. They didn't even know what the whole world was. If you even showed them a globe, they wouldn't know what that was. They, they had no idea. They had no concept that there were other continents on the world. They had no concept of the other people groups and the, the, all the different variation of God's brilliant creativity and the way he made people. They had no concept of that. But Jesus knew that if they took him seriously and they lived to be lights, to, to shine forth, him and his value system and his kingdom that there would be a ripple effect that would literally cover the world and today as i speak to you in 2022 every continent is dotted with churches this morning that's preaching this same message of jesus that were started because those people took what jesus said seriously that they said okay jesus we'll start right where we are and we're going to be lights And we're going to really take this to heart. And we're going to really start to live it. And we're not going to just like play a game of Christianity. Like, yeah, I go to church on Sunday, but then I do whatever the heck I want the rest of the time of the week. (laughs) Which is, I mean, let's be honest. That's the way a lot of people live. But Jesus didn't stop here. He says, you are the light of the world. And here's where he he continues. He says, a town, he's using a metaphor again. A town, let's say it together. A town what? A town built on a hill cannot be hidden right now now think about this world word built when something is built if you've ever built anything if you built a shed or a house or if you you've built anything at all it takes intentionality it takes strategy right It takes thinking about where are you going to put that and where's the foundation going to be and how is the foundation going to work and have we got it engineered properly and is this everything square and is it going to, the door's going to close properly or we have foundation issues, whatever. You've got to think about all these things. It is strategic how it is put together. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, Jesus says. 
Now, we, we, we forget about how dramatic this could be in the first century because we live in a city where we're just inundated with street lights and lights and signs and all kinds of stuff when the sun goes down. But if you were in the first century, you would be astonished at how dark it would get once the sun dropped down. If you've ever like camped out way back in the country, I mean back in the sticks, way back, I actually had the benefit of growing up in the sticks. So um, back in the 80s in Driftwood, Texas, where I grew up and uh, uh, my dad had bought almost 80 acres, which was just a dream for a teenage boy. And, and we would go way back in the back and we would love to just spend the night. But I remember a few nights, we'd be way back there. And uh, I mean, once the fire goes out and everything, and if it was an overcast night and there was no moon, I kid you not, it'd be like, I couldn't see my hand right here. It was so dark. And you start hearing things in the wood, it will make you pray. Let me just tell you something. <laughs> Uh, it's scary, but so you think about a first century experience like that pretty flat Territory around in the Palestinian area and then there's this town that has been strategically built up on a hill if there's even one Candle in a window that's facing you as you come closer to the town. That's all you will see is that light and that light will guide you in and he's saying that's exactly what I want for your life I want you to understand that you were strategically placed where you are right now. Now you may say, well, I don't know how strategic it was because me moving here, um, it was for school, and then, or we moved here because of a job, or I was chasing a relationship, that happens sometimes, and then that fell apart, and then I'm, I don't really know why I'm here now, and um, you may feel like ah, there's really no reason, rhyme or reason to why I am where I am in life right now. You may not have had a strategy, but God has one. And he has put you in that job you're in, in that dormitory, that apartment complex, that neighborhood that you live in, strategically. Because he wants you to shine his light to those around you. He's going to use you. It is not random. God says you are strategically placed to be a light. And he goes on to say this in verse 15, and I love this. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Like people in the first century would go, no, what? nobody does that. These little lamps that they had, you could probably fit one in the palm of my hand, and it was filled with oil, it had a little wick that stuck out, and it would light that, and it would be strategically placed. And instead, they wouldn't put it under a bowl. Instead, they would put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. It's, it's, it's amazing how that one little lamp could light up an entire room. Now, some of you guys may remember this. Back in 2021, you remember what has come to be called Snowmageddon, all right? We had the rolling blackouts for like almost a week. And I remember those first few days that, that rolled by and everybody, we were all thinking, are we going to live? Are we going to make it? You know, and sure enough, we did. It was, it was uh, we, we lived. And, but I remember some of those nights when for us, all the lights went out, just like probably at your house, and we had a couple of candles, and we strategically placed them in the living room. And I was amazed, once your eyes adjust, I could pretty much see everything in there from those candles. And, and it's kind of amazing. It reminds me of this idea that, that light has a power that is disproportionate to its size. It's so little, it doesn't seem like it should have this much powerful impact on the darkness, but it does. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying to us. You have no idea the amount of power I can exert through your life if you will choose to be a light for me. If you will let me shine through you, I can make such a difference in this world through your life. And I know you may be saying, no, well, not me. I, I mean, I'm, not the, I'm like the new guy. I'm, I'm like low man on the totem pole. I'm the girl that nobody seems to look for. I'm not influential like some people. I don't care. If you're willing to say, Jesus, use me. Shine through me. He will. He will use you. He will use you in ways you never dreamed possible. It's so powerful. But you've got to be willing to say, yes. And this is how Jesus wraps up these two beautiful metaphors in verse 16. He says, in the same way, 
In the same way of like the light shining all over the room, like the, the, the city engineered and built up on the hill cannot be hidden, just like the salt can't lose its saltiness. Uh, he says, in the same way, let your, let's say it together, let your light shine. One translation says, let your light glow. Glow for Jesus, right? Before who? Before others. Not just other Christians, not just your family, not just your friends. Everybody. Others means everybody. Let your light shine before wherever you go. I don't care. It's not a mistake. Jesus put you there to be a light. Don't you underestimate that. He wants to use you. Let your light shine before others that they may see your what? Your, your good deeds. And what are they going to do? And glorify your Father in heaven. When you shine correctly, people will know. They will make the connection. Whoa. Nobody's that generous. <laughs> Look at her. Look how she behaves, even when people are ugly to her. Look, look at the character. Look at the, what's emanating from her life, the flavor, the seasoning, the, the beauty in it all. Look at, look, like nobody's like that. Who does that? And they will begin to say, oh, it's that faith she has in God. It's that relationship that he has. Oh, you ever notice that every time Jesus did a miracle, people's knee-jerk response was praising God. They praised God in heaven because Jesus made it abundantly clear that he was God in the flesh and he was acting with God's power. And we ought to do the same. He's showing us an example of how to be salt and light. He's showing us that when we act on behalf of God, his truth, his love to people... I'm not talking about getting up in people's grill and preaching to them, and especially when they don't want to hear it. That is the opposite. That is being repulsive. But if we would show them love and kindness and speak the truth in love. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And we forget the grace part sometimes. Or we have so much grace, we never get around to telling the truth. So we, we've got to have both. And he's saying, this is how you do it. And I want to encourage you that you would be willing to step up. Let me use you. Jesus is showing us also that being his disciple, it must change our behavior. It has to change the way we talk. It changes the way we behave. It changes the way we treat people. It, it changes us. Radically, it changes us. And so... Um, I want to get you just to think about how does God want to begin to use you as a light right where you are, right in your workplace, right where you live, among your circle of friends? How would he have you to be willing to say, okay, God, help me to make a difference. Help me to step up and do the right thing even when it might irritate some of the other people. They may say, why don't you just go along? Why don't you just do what we do? Why, don't you, why are you making ways? Why are you... They're trying to adulterate the sand. They're trying to put sand in the salt. You've got to just say, look, I'm not trying to offend you, hurt you. But I have to follow, my Lord. I have to follow what God's told me to do. And people have done this down through history, ladies and gentlemen, and it has been so incredibly powerful how God has used it to change the course of human history. Let me share with you just a, a few of these from Dr. J.W. Breedy and his book, This Freedom. And there's many books like this of historical accounts of how Christ following people through history have made a difference. He says, prison reform, medical care, most of the hospitals down through history started by Christian organizations, the abolition of slavery. Men like William Wilberforce, under the leadership of the Spirit of God, started that. Abolition of child labor, the establishment of orphanages. George Mueller, every, miracle after miracle that God did to use him to begin orphanages. In all these areas, followers of Jesus spearheaded the drive for righteousness by being light. That they were willing to say, God, 
I know this is not going to be popular, and maybe no one else will jump on board with me, but i got to do something about this. This can't go on. This can't be like this. I know this is not your will. I know that you don't want it to be this way, God. And I'm going to stand up. And what was beautiful, when they were willing to exert the faith and the strength and the courage to stand up, other people stood with them. And other children of God and people who were not, maybe not even followers of God came to faith in God because they were willing to be salt and light in days of great darkness. And we face one of those days again right now, ladies and gentlemen. And we've got to ask the question, what would Jesus say to us today? And I truly believe he would say exactly what he said in the first century to us in 2022. He would say, it's time for you. Maybe more than you ever have before. Before you've, even, you've ever dared to dream. I want you to be salt. I want you to be light. I want you to be the flavor of Jesus to other people. I want you to shine forth the good deeds, the character and, 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 and kindness of Jesus to other people. Again, this isn't just a behavior modification step. This is us becoming true to who our heart is and belongs to. That we really are the Lord's and we're going to start living that way. And besides, I bet you, if you're honest about your own personal history, the reason that those of you who are faith, uh, have faith in Jesus and followers of Jesus today, part of your story, at least in part, Many of you would say it's because someone else was light and salt to me, a friend, a family member. Somebody st stepped up and they were willing to make a difference in my life. And now Jesus would probably say, exactly, now it is your turn. It's time for you. And maybe you've never thought about yourself like this. I want you to be my salt. I want you to be my light. Right where you live, right among your friends. And you might lose a few friends over this. That's okay. Jesus will walk with you through that too. He's like, I'm calling you to a life that you can't get any other way than to walk with me and to trust me. And Jesus would say, you are not a city that was built on a hill to be hidden. You are not a light that is to be covered over with a bowl. Don't do that. Salt that is adulterated and light that is covered is not fulfilling its purpose. And some of you here are not fulfilling yours. And he's saying, it's time for you to step up and let me start to use you. I love this promise of Jesus. And it just kind of clears the air of, wait, so we're the light of God, but it is God's light. Make no bones about that. No question about that. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What an amazing promise. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me takes me seriously and really begins to put into practice what I taught, what I modeled, the way I lived. You will never walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. What a great legacy for your life. The question is, are you ready to do that? Are you ready? What do you say? Is it... Are you ready to make a difference? Are you ready to really make an impact in this world, in this life, while we still have time, while we still got lung, lungs having air coming in and out of them, we got a, a heart still beating in our chest, we got time. Let's make use of the time, right? Over the next several weeks, we're gonna talk about how to make the most of that time we've been given. I'm gonna talk to you more about that. Now, here's our prayer of application today, simply starting by saying, Jesus, make an impact through my life. I commit to be salt and light to those around me. Jesus, be my light, my forgiver, my Lord. And some of you that are not Christians today, you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a, a child of God, you need to start with that, that last phrase right there. Jesus, I want you to be my light. Forgive all my sin. Cleanse me from unrighteousness, and I want you to be my Lord. And some of you have already done that, but it's time for you to take that next critical step in your discipleship, your followship of Jesus, and say, okay, and now, Jesus, I'm finally serious about this. I want you to start to use me as salt and light wherever I go. Would you be willing to do that? Let's go before him in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the challenge that your sermon is to us today, right down to this moment. 
It is just as relevant, just as powerful than the, the moment, the second those words came out of your mouth. And I pray, God, that today we would not let them become diminished by our fears, by our worries about what are people going to think, our worries about the outcome. If I really do this, what's that going to look like? God, let us let you worry about all of that. You wouldn't call us to something that, that would be for our detriment. It would not be for our deterioration. You have called us to be a preservative. But the, the reality is that many of us, if we were honest, this world has begin, begun to deteriorate our hearts. But God, I pray that the regenerating power of your Holy Spirit would rebuild what has been lost. That you bring that hope back that you would bring back the peace and the joy that's been lost. That you would bring back the purpose and the meaning that you meant for our lives to have, but we have lost it because we lost sight of being salt and light. All across this room right now, if you know God is telling you, I want you. He's tapping on your shoulder. The Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart right now, and you can't deny it. And you would be willing to say, I'm going to say yes to God. I'm going to take that next step to be salt and light wherever I am currently and wherever I'm going to go in the future. If that is your commitment, would you just make it with me by just raising your hand right now? Would you just raise your hand? Thank you for the hands going up all over the room, the balcony and the floor. And would you just pray with me just silently right where you are and just say, Jesus, I'm yours. Help me more than ever before to become your salt and your light. Help me to be that light that gives light to the entire room of my surroundings. That people may see your good deeds through me and they will praise you in heaven. Use us, God. Use us. You may lower your hands. God, I pray for any person that's here, Lord, that would honestly say, I don't know where I would spend eternity if I were to die right now. I don't know how, where I stand with God. I don't know my spiritual condition before God. I don't know if I'm saved or not. If you would just be so honest right now, and, and, but, but there's a desire in you to say, but I want to be right with God. Would you pray right where you sit and just say, right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you would forgive my sin and you would become the leader and Lord of my life right now, right here. I don't want to waste another day. And help me to become salt and light for you. And you may even be so honest to say, I don't even know fully what that means yet, but I'm saying yes, because I know you wouldn't ask me to do something that wouldn't be good for me. And if you just ask Jesus to forgive your sin and be the Lord of your life for the very first time, would you just raise your hand right now? I just want to praise God for you. Anybody here giving your life over to God fully for the first time? Anybody here? Floor, balcony. God bless you, ma'am. Right here, I see you. Anybody else? Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy. I pray, God, that you would help us to take seriously your words. Help us to learn to be generous, giving, compassionate, truth tellers, full of grace, just like you, Jesus. We pray it all in the powerful, miracle working name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. God, have a great week. We'll see you next week as we continue the big gift. See you then.